It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things, and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 246. Tonight, I'm joined by Ashgar. Hello. Grace. Hello. Kodra. Hi. And Phelan. Hey there. My show card didn't have a number on it, so I was scrambling to figure out which the next sequence was, because reason. Um, yeah, this is going to be an interesting show. Uh, we're down a TAM. Um, the only topic that we had to roll over from last week was a TAM topic, so we're going to be trying to scramble for topics tonight. It might be interesting. Dude, we should have paid more attention to PAX. Possibly. I mean, there wasn't... Like, there were things announced at PAX, but there weren't a ton of things announced at PAX. Like, the the biggest thing that I saw today on, on a PAX stream was um, the new Obsidian game. The Outer Worlds. Outer Worlds, yeah. I saw some playthrough of it, and it and it made me even more excited about getting the final version. You mean a year after it launches? I mean, it's it's mostly Fallout in a Firefly-esque setting i mean like most of their interactions reminded me a lot of fallout yeah when Um, is that game supposed to come out this year sometime i don't know how i feel about that yeah like all it has is a 2019 release date there's Uh no there's no time associated with that so uh uh-huh that's I'm that, sure we can trust that date. That probably sure. means 2020. <laughs> yeah, that's like 2020. I Although, mean, I just the demo they showed off looked pretty. Like they they basically said they don't have any of the voice acting, so they showed off dialogue, um, like on screen dialogue. But one one will see. Like that's really the only bit of pa- packs that I've watched. Huh. Pretty much the only thing I've seen of packs is people posting pictures of themselves posing with a Final Fantasy Etherite. <laughs> I'm very jealous of that. So were they running like one of the the primal fights there th- th- this time? I think Sir- Sir- Yeah, they are. It's it's either Seru or no, I guess they ran Yojimbo at FanFest, so I think it's Seru. Yeah, FanFest was Yojimbo. Oh, and since I missed the discussion of FanFest last week, the the main thing I wanted to to mention that I didn't get to is that they may finally manage to get me to Fantasia into a Lollafell. <laughs> oh, why <laughs> was that? Because, because Lollafell because are dwarves. dwarves are Lollafells, and if they go the way they normally have, once you rank up high enough with the Dwarf Beast Tribe, you will be able to get a dwarf costume, at which point I can Fantasia into a Lollafell and just wear a dwarf hat all the time. Lolly ho. <laughs> I'm just saying, Lollafell or Bestafell. I think Grace is staring me down through the internet after I, that. I, I'm glad that you could feel that because you all know how I feel about Broken Aim. <laughs> and now that I'm actually starting to play the game again, my love for them is just renewed. Yay. Yeah, def- definitely like let me help you get caught up on stuff. Because I, I want to help you get caught up on stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> a, the thing about coming back after a very long absence where I haven't been playing really any MMOs for months is that uh, like i want to jump back in and heal butts but also i don't remember what the hell i was doing i don't remember any of these dungeons like Mm -hmm. i need a friend to come and help me so that when i'm terrible people won't scream at me yeah i know that feel like the the, a the the main thing that i have been missing from playing final fantasy recently is like running dungeons and things with friends because most of you guys haven't been playing, and the people in our free company that do play have different time schedules than me. Particularly since, you know, I have a small child now, and that steals lots of time. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, yeah, want to run things. And then, yeah, also, I mean, I finally, finally ran the burn this past week because I actually had free time and sufficient energy to queue for it simultaneously, which is a, a rare event. And yeah, that's the thing. It turned out to actually not be difficult at all. Maybe I just lucked out and got good players. I think I don't you know. got a good group. I I really think you got a good group. I have failed that final boss multiple times. <laughs> and then I also did the Will of the Moon in one try, so I don't know. You you are 
godlike. I'm just saying. I mean, it probably helps that I've been spending a fair amount of time in Eureka, so I'm item level 370, thanks yeah. to Eureka gear and uh, Skaven jewelry. So, but, yeah. So the moon trial thingy. Not to go into any detail since Grace hasn't seen it, but like... Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I failed five times before I finally succeeded. And on the fifth time, I got to the final phase for the very first time, and the server shut down. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see why it would make people frustrated to fail that one. Like, because... Like, the main thing is it's it's very long. There's it's multiple phases and there's no checkpoints. Yeah, and if you fail you have to start over from the very beginning. So I I absolutely get why people would be very annoyed at failing. And I was very happy when I did not fail. <laughs> yeah, like I thought okay, on on try number five, I'm like, I'm finally gonna get through this. And then apparently you don't see emergency server maintenance messages when you're in a fate oh, no. thingy because oh, no. you're not instance. in the world so it's just like bloop and i got a message this server's been shut down for emergency maintenance no but yeah it's i mean the last dungeon i did was a cakewalk even the dark yeah yeah i'm yeah. working my way up to that one now but like to to reiterate what grace said um like i came back and I didn't feel comfortable tanking for strangers, so I've largely been samuraiing this entire time. So that's the class that I have geared at the moment. I mean, warrior isn't too far off, but like I've just not been tanking. I've just been samuraiing because it's easier to poke butts than tank butts mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, less responsibility. Yeah, I've been thinking about like being a summoner for a little while, but problem is that's even worse geared than my healer which is you know i don't know how many patches behind things right now so it's a trade-off i traded money for item level so, no. so this is straight the, up this is the other thing <laughs> that is making me sad about coming back is that i like before i left like a little ways before i left i spent all my money on a house and then mm. i didn't play so they took my house away and you only get a partial refund of that when Aww. they do yeah. that so and I right now you basically poor. can't even if you have the money you basically can't get a house yeah but you probably will soon because they yeah, just restart be... your automatic demolitions again i think they're restarting it in two weeks is what they said but yeah so i'm going to be keeping an eye out because i want a house i have no money anymore i spent it on gear <laughs> I, I spent centurio seals to get to item level 340 and then I, I did that. <laughs> and then have used Animos to work my way up from there. I finished my Pagos weapon. I'm now working on Pyros. You said a sequence of words that don't make any sense, but good <laughs> job, Thalen. <laughs> we talked about Eureka two weeks ago, but they're yeah. named after like the Greek elements. Yeah, I know, but like the the names of Eureka still don't mean anything. Like I don't know which one I've been to. I mean, Animos if you've only is the been first one, one you've and it's Air. Pagos, the second one, and it's what? No, it's ice, ice, and then Pyros is Pyros, and then Hydrados is the last fire. one. Hydrados is the last one, so that was also kind of obvious. Yeah, and I realized that I apparently, instead of using Centurio seals to gear up alternate classes, I should have been spending them on hunt logs to get upgrade stuff for Skaven gear. So I've started doing that. I will probably be playing tomorrow because I really want to see the next batch of story because it kind of left the story in a weird place so yeah they did add a new trial this patch and it's not part of the main story quest oh, oh thank yeah. god attached to the hildebrand quest instead it's jim oh thank god so i won't have <laughs> i won't be basically stalled out for this next batch of story because i need to get more gear but yeah that's that's the other thing is i we, we need to get a group of people together to run Jim because it's Hildebrand. Jim? Hey, Jimbo. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gilgamesh is Greg. Yo, Jimbo is Jim. I think I'm like the only person in our social circle who just dislikes the Hildebrand stuff. It makes me sort of sad. It seems like it ought to be delightful, but it just doesn't do it for me. I mean, 
the quests it's are real out there, so it's pretty understandable. It is. It is. Yeah, the the quests are weird, but like I loved the trials that were associated with Hildebrand. Yeah. Like I mean, those yeah, fights I, I were great. Get, you would That's true. They were fun. Hildebrand. Like there's no real middle ground there. Like I I didn't really love the quest chains, but the fights were fun. Oh, and they added the uh, the Beast Tribe wrap up. Yeah, but I haven't. I'm behind in Namazu, so I yep. am nowhere near that one. I'll give I'll give you I'll give you one guess who who the villain of the Beast Tribe finale quest is. That idiot Mikoto dude. <laughs> He's back. I mean, at this point, I have his mask and I have something else of his. Don't I? I don't remember what you did the second time second around. Time. We didn't Other get than... his gun, which made me sad because I like that gun. I mean, the most important thing you get from that is the Moonlit Advance. So that's, that's yeah, that. Advance. But this time you get an emote. <laughs> So, did I hear correctly that the regalia is going to be an MGP item? Yes. That's correct. I Data really hope I have enough. Be. Probably have enough. It's 200k. Oh, that's not that bad. That's easy. Especially, yeah, you do... That's four weeks of fashion if you do absolutely nothing else. Speaking of which, this week is one of the easiest um, fashion things in a while. Like, if you haven't done one and gotten 100 points, this is a good week to do it. I have no idea how the fashion thing works at all. Like, I was trying to read through that, and... I mean, so just go, you, go, you pick go to outfit. Reddit, see which gear you need to wear, wear that gear, talk to the guy. <laughs> Collect MGP. That, that's really all you need to do. Release the description, the text description of the gear he's going to be looking for early in the week, I think on Tuesday. Yep. And then on and, Friday, judging begins, and people can yeah. test their theories. Yeah, and there there are four slots each of which is, has a description associated with it, and you need there, and you need specific gear types of gear for each of those slots, and then all the other slots just to have to have something in them. And then there's points for particular items in those slots. There's also points for uh, having a particular color of, of of the item, like the right color family is worth one point. The specific color that is desired is two points. But you have all four of the items exactly. I think you can get 100 points without having any dice at all. Yep. And the only benefit of getting 100 points is getting the achievement if you haven't already done so. Otherwise, there's no real reason to go for higher than 80. Which you can do with two items. Yep. Perfect items. And it is very easy to get... It's very, very easy to get two items this time. It's pretty easy to get all to get four. The I mean, Animos jacket that got a little on pricey the jacket. this week. Yeah, the, the jacket got a little pricey this week. It's the, the the ones I've sold in previous weeks. You know, I either sold sold had my retainer sell them, or if I was lucky, sold for a couple of hundred. Uh, I sold one yesterday for ninety thousand. What? Because people are silly. <laughs> I really need to crack open the rest of my Animos boxes and see if I have any more in there. You don't need it for any. Oh, okay, whatever. But yeah, the um at that price, there are going to be a lot of regalias driving around Final Fantasy fourteen. It's going to be a little silly, but whatever. Eureka is going to be full of them. I'm I'm fine with that. Like I I'm fine with the fact that like there's lots of Twintanias. <laughs> I'm fine with all the the mounts being duplicated over and over. Because this is the game where people, if they have the same mount, they make parades. Yes. <laughs> yes. So there's going to be glorious. There's going to be regalia parades. parades, and that's a little silly, but it's going to be a thing that happens. Yes, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be pretty great. I think that happens, what, the 16th-ish or so? That sounds right. I mean, I assume it'll be on a Tuesday. So yeah, for whatever be... reason, that's the date that was stuck in my head. Yeah, so that would be the 16th. But now that people are, are being active again, I should be active again in Final Fantasy fourteen. You should. I was back playing a lot of it, and then Anthem happened, and then Division mm-hmm. 2 happened, and this week it's been Breath of the Wild. So Lots of things need happening. To, yeah, just like me being distracted by other things. Okay, Koja, I think you're the, probably the person who's been following this the most. How has the Mythic Invitational been going? Because I've not watched any of it. Okay, so the Mythic Invitational is a magic tournament with uh, basically the top 32 uh, magic pros from the last season. Uh, This is sort of their new way of supporting the professional Magic players. They become part of the MPLS, the Magic Pro League series or something. Uh, And they get an invite to this. And then uh, another 24 streamer content creator, uh, people who are well-known get invites. 
And then a final eight slots are reserved for the top eight players in arena at uh, a certain point in time when the invites go out. So there's a pretty big mix of players here. And that's really cool. It's really cool to see like people who, you know, have a play style listed as casual commander and who have never actually been to a competitive tournament before get an invite to the biggest prize supported uh, tournament in Magic's history. And like this is the first million dollar tournament Magic's ever hosted. It just seems uh, like a really weird mix of people. It it is, but it's been fun. Like, so one of the things it's very different because it's not being played with paper. It's all played on arena, and that means a couple of things. But most notably, it means that you don't have to be a professional Magic player in order to compete. Because under if no you're circumstance, do you ever have to go judge? Yes. Under no circumstance do you ever need to, like, raise your hand and shout for a judge. Magic Arena is taking care of the judging for you. Magic Arena is also taking care of how magic works for you. And I imagine a lot of the pacing is improved because, like, the the, the game just kind of moves forward if you take too long. Uh, kind of? Like, there's definitely still, like, hey, we need to think here, like, go into the tank moments for players... But, uh, yeah, like, you're never going to miss a trigger. You're, you're never going to forget what, what is going to happen, like, when things, when a bunch of complicated things are happening. The game is going to let you sequence things for yourself. And the fact that you don't need to be able to, like, off of the top of your head, know how everything is interacting with everything else means you can just focus on making good plays. I mean, it also means that Kark Clan Ironworks isn't in Arena. <laughs> it does mean that Kark Clan Ironworks isn't in Arena. I mean, it's not in anything anymore. It got banned, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I I just like... Because that was like my thing is like, I would never want to have to play a paper tournament. But because it's Arena, like, yeah, that would be like... I am willing to match myself up against these high-level professionals. I just don't want to have to like... The the act of constantly maintaining board state and constantly being like you have to have a knowledge of magic rules that is really high is it's it's a big barrier to entry. I'm I really like that you just need to have a computer that tells you how the rules work. There's no negotiation there. It just works or it doesn't. And now this does mean that you can misclick. And that's not a great experience, but it's really cool. Also a much more diverse crowd than, you know, the top of most Magic tournaments. I imagine so. Granted, I'm pretty sure it's now uh, three MPLS members. Actually, I think it's two MPLS members and one former MPLS member and one guy who got in who was a former Magic pro who got in through the top eight spot. But the best, the top 16 was a pretty broad group. And now these four get to play for a quarter of a million dollars. Also, uh, the the casting has been really good. It's been uh, fun to have Day 9 hosting. And you've got uh, Marshall Sutcliffe and Paul Cheon and Alias, Alias 5 and Brian Williams. Good crew. It's really funny because uh, Alias... It's alias V, and whenever anyone says it, it's like, wait, that sounds too much like LSV, and that's who we would normally expect in this booth. Also, I recommend checking it out because it kind of shows you just how diverse Standard is right now. Standard's in a really healthy place. I say that sounds very different than about a year ago. It's Yeah, it's, it's very different than about a year ago. I mean, Ravnica came and brought a lot of interesting options. Also, I think... M19 was a decent set. Yeah, and Dominaria still has some good stuff in it, too. But also it still has Teferi. It does still have Teferi, and, like, if I was going to point to this is a problem, it would probably be the fact that there are quite a few decks whose win condition is I get a Teferi emblem and play, I destroy all of your lands, and then I 
just keep putting Teferi back on the top of my deck so I can't deck myself and watch you draw cards until you die. That is that is an actual win condition. It's not fun to watch. But you've got... You, you have mono white, mono red, mono green, mono blue decks. Like, the only color that you don't have a supported mono-colored version of is probably black right now. I mean... Really- like it, it's not a competitive deck, but I absolutely have an all black deck that I play on arena. That that weird creature burn deck. Yeah, it's very funny because uh, the I really think the triple uh, colored mana uh, cards were a great touch because all of those like. The only one that I would the one I would consider the weakest is probably the black one, and as a result, that's the only one that isn't showing up. But Goblin Chain Whirler, Steel Leaf, uh, Nut Champion, Hero of Banalish or Banalish Marshall, and uh, Tempest Jin all have decks around those cards. Steel Leaf Champion is just so good. Steel Leaf Champion is one of my favorite cards now. It's like. It's- Turn two, Steel Leaf Champion. Turn two, Black. Steel Leaf Champion. Turn three, Steel Leaf Champion. Turn four, Golta. <laughs> Rawr. I do you like dinosaurs. It, I do find it funny how much the community has turned around on Experimental Frenzy after initially just kind of dismissing it. That's a really weird card. It's a really and weird difficult card. difficult to evaluate. Yep. Turns out weird, janky draw effects in red sometimes work. Because it's a draw effect, right? Sure. It gets you more cards. It gets you more cards. <laughs> Just for the record, Experimental Friendly is a card that does not let you play cards in your hand, but you can play the top card of your deck if you can. So it's like your deck is your hand, question mark. But you're always top decking. You're, you're always, always top, top decking. There's also a card called uh, uh, Steamkin something. That says every time you play a red spell, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it, as long as it has uh, less than three counters. But you can remove three counters to add three red mana to your uh, mana pool. Runaway Steamkin. Runaway, yeah, Runaway Steamkin. So you have a Runaway Steamkin down, and you have Experimental Frenzy, and you just play your way through your deck. And you hope you don't hit mountains. But yeah, uh, the events are cool. I definitely want to see more tournaments like this. This is probably my favorite tournament I've watched in a long time. Not least of all because, like, for a lot of the... Especially for, like, people in the top eight, this is, like, their one shot type of deal. Like, they get a lot more excited and amped up and emotional than, you know, the pros who are treating this like they would a poker tournament where they have to, like, blink their faces. Well, and like since the the opponent is sitting across the way with a monitor in front of him, reading the opponent is probably less of a thing than it would be in a traditional match. Mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting that they chose to do this at PAX East, as opposed to. I mean, it it wouldn't be their home PAX. Yeah, but that's not until September. Yeah, true. It was probably just a timing thing, I guess. I mean, PAX East is probably bigger than E three at this point. Yeah, true. So of the top four, two of them are the Magic Pros. One of them is one of the challengers who happens to be a Hearthstone player, so I'm sure there will be salt over that. And one of them <laughs> is one of the top eight players. Which is so- <laughs> it is. <laughs> but hey, M- M- Mad- Wizards is Wizards seems to be handling Arena very, very well. So this is the first time they've had an online venture that they've had that we can say they've handled well. I think so. Like, I don't know if you guys can name anything else. You can name a few failed ones. No, I can name a few failed ones. I'm not thinking of any other successes, really. Nope. And I know they've got, like, a big patch coming up for Arena that's going to add a bunch of quality of life type stuff. And then soon we have the War of the Spark. <laughs> I, like, the rumors I'm hearing is that's going to have a Planeswalker in every pack. That That'd be weird. That would be weird. That would be structurally weird. I mean, if you want to have this big giant to do with Nico Bolas and all the mem- former members of the Gatewatch, and you know every single other planeswalker that's not dead yet, pretty much, and supposedly like a whole new cast of ones that we've not seen, like by a large number. So, like, 
I'm curious what they're gonna do because even bad planeswalkers are like frequently game warping and limited. Like I guess if everyone has them, that's a different thing. Might make just a very weird limited. Yeah. I mean, I feel like they really need to carry forth the Immortal Sun into a, a future set if they're <laughs> going to put that many Planeswalkers in. That's probably true, though. For for those who have no clue what that card is, it basically shuts down Planeswalkers. Shuts down Planeswalkers for the most part. I'm, I'm sure it will be interesting. I look forward to the story. Maybe this will finally be the end of the Gatewatch and Nicol Bolas. I would be really happy if Jace died. That, that thing. Jace is horrible. But Vraska would be so sad and miss his abs so much. So that's the only I mean, counter argument I can see for Jace, Jace going away being a bad thing. It would make Vraska upset. Because Vraska is a lot cooler than Jace is. Vraska is way cooler. Like, a Gorgon Planeswalker is awesome. And she's she's planning on betraying Nicol Bolas. Well, she doesn't know she's planning on betraying Nicol Bolas, but she was planning on... Magic lore is weird. There are too many telepaths in magic lore. I mean, one of them needs to die. Or would two that just of fix them some of that, to... right? I was going to say, two of them need to die. That's fair. Nico Bolas does also need to die. Who would that leave as a villain? Uh, the Phyrexians. Ah, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. I mean, we've not really had Phyrexians playing a major role in it's a been while. It's been a while. Phyrexian ulted to be a card again, so hopefully that, that happens. Also, Yogmoth. Like, what's Yogmoth up to? Mm. You know, the actual devil. Yeah. <laughs> Could build a whole new plane, kind of like they did with Wrath. We, uh, I mean, we're getting a Sarah Planeswalker. We could it's part get, of like... A, part of a supplementary set. It's true, but we A Yogmoth get... Planeswalker? Get a Yogmoth Planeswalker. Like, Yogmoth, uh... Yawgmoth would be good because everyone has him in their heads as some, like, big, awful creature because they have died to his spells so many times. Whether it's <laughs> Yawgmoth's Bargain or Yawgmoth's Will, those are cards that you have died to. Or Urbog Tomb of whatever. Yeah, Urbog Tomb of Yawgmoth. The Phyrexians are still around. I don't know. There's plenty of folks still around. Nicol Bolas has just always been the mastermind villain. And so when you're telling stories, it's fun to have a mastermind villain. But, like, Mirrodin wasn't doing so hot the last time we left it, if I recall correctly. No, not really. No, it really wasn't. And the Phyrexians were just, you know, sort of satisfied to build up. So maybe they're about to do some unfortunate things. Hey, look at that. One of the planeswalkers that is now around is Karn. So maybe he'll play a more prominent role in the story. It's either that or the other alternative is we uh, do the WoW raid boss thing on... They watch. Nicol I was actually thinking Nicol Bolas's brother. Who's oh, me. uh, Ugin? Yeah, Ugin. I'm not... Sh I remain unconvinced that Ugin isn't an Eldrazi to start with. It's like, just, that's a thing, maybe? I was gonna say, the Eldrazi are mostly taken care of. There's one that isn't. It's an Amun. It's not taken care of. It's an Amun. Also, I'd like that setting back, please. You want Innistrad again? I'd like to print a Werewolf Lord that is good. Innistrad is great. Like, that, I will, just like Ravnica is a good plane to cycle through every so often because the themes are popular, I think Innistrad is another one that's worth cycling through because... I like gothic horror. I would not mind going back to Kamigawa. <laughs> that was a weird block. They'd have to figure out how to make Kamigawa without completely broken cards this time. Because they, uh, if I remember correctly, they did a kind of poor job of it last time. I mean, just because Jitte existed. There are other broken cards in that, I in that set, I believe. Yes, that is Planeswalker before Planeswalkers existed. It's still just ridiculously powerful in any format you can play it. Where can you play it? Because it's only banned in Modern, right? Yeah. Because so, and Vintage have enough other busted stuff. Yeah. It's pointed in Highlander. Sure. How many points? I think one. Okay. So, other things that came out of the run-up to PAX. Uh, we got a Wolfenstein Youngblood trailer. So, I'm, I'm curious. Who all has seen this trailer? I did not know it existed for tonight. I did not either. So yeah, I haven't seen it either. It's, uh, so the story of Youngblood 
is it is what like probably like 14 years after the set the events of uh wolfenstein new colossus yeah it's 1980 so yeah it's set in the 80s and you are playing as the protagonist dj blaskowitz twin daughters and like the story is blaskowitz is missing the the kids have been raised on their by their mother and they want to find their dad but like they're going to do what their dad does and kill a whole bunch of nazis on the way to finding him and it's like a designed to be co-op game but i was like i am both very much into this thing but like it managed to put me off because i am not used to like juxtaposing uh children with this level of ultra violence well do we know how old they are in this they seem young i mean they seem about maybe 16 17 i guess that's a better bit better i i i don't know why i was thinking more like younger than that even well actually no we we should know we know how old they are um new colossus happened new colossus happened in 64 mm-hmm. okay well and this happens uh, in 80 so this happens in 80 so, so they'd be like 16, 16 yeah it's 16 years later well so, uh, yeah yeah 16 yeah 16, 16 15, 15 16, 16 depending on exactly when their birth date is when yeah but yeah you play as the terror twins like I'm I'm excited. I love co-op shooters. Uh, this looks like it's gonna be like knowing how the gameplay of Wolfenstein works. I think it would be really cool to play this with another person, especially yeah. if the game is designed for it. Like, you don't have to play co-op. If you don't, you get an AI to play for you to play your other partner. But it's very much like co-op first game, right? To the point where, like, if you get the deluxe version, you get a copy for, like, that you can give to other people that, so they can play with you while you are playing. Okay, so they're actually older. According according to the wiki, they're older than that. It is set 19 years after the events of New Colossus. Huh. That... They don't look that old. That yeah, they they don't look nineteen. I'm just saying, like that's that's the timing that they're saying on the the wiki. Okay. Because the well, okay, the, so yeah, I guess actually, um, uh, New Order takes place in 1960. New Colossus starts immediately after New Order ends. There's six months of running on the sub before the game really begins. So yeah, it's like 1961. So yeah, okay, they would be eighteen, nineteen. But yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited. I'm I'm really excited to see the this this storyline continued, and for BJ to not be the protagonist. I yes, I I have been wanting a game where we are doing the Wolfenstein thing, and you are not playing as BJ. Yeah, I I I really hoped that New Colossus would have us playing somebody else, but we be we, we Young Blood can be that game. I mean, I I thought we were going to play as a specific character during New Colossus, but that didn't happen. But BJ cannot die. <laughs> you know, and in another game or two, we can play Billy. <laughs> <laughs> and Commander Keen is born. As the storyline advances. I As far as trailer releases and uh, packs went, I think the biggest one was Borderlands 3. And I did not watch the mess of a live stream but good you shouldn't no one should i yeah i i saw you guys you like you guys talking about it and like just that just made me sad for them it, that did not sound good i'm glad their borderlands 3 trailer video worked because their borderlands trailer what borderlands 1 trailer video never did and they weren't super clear about this but i guess if you already own those games you're just going to get the hd copies given to you well that's nice yeah so it's like the skyrim thing which like i was i was afraid it would be a resell um because the their duke nukem game that they did several years ago when they did the hd remaster they resold it i can't think of the name of that game not actually duke nukem but the other thing yeah yeah but it, it was a duke nukem ish game i know what game you're talking about i can't think of the name of it right now bulletstorm yeah I, yeah bulletstorm when they remastered it, they charged full price for it. 
So uh, it's it sounded like they were trying to do a thing where they convinced people they're a publisher. Yeah, more that's or what less. Tam said. But yes, I mean they are a publisher, sort of. Just that they're a publisher with only one useful IP at the moment. Right. They did show uh, Risk of Rain two on stage for some reason. I didn't understand if they were publishing that on console. They're not publishing it on PC, so I don't Maybe know why they were on stage like with it. it. I didn't really understand a lot of things that were going on at that conference. So the biggest point of confusion for me is mentally I was mistaking a Borderlands intro from a Borderlands reveal trailer. Because <laughs> I was like, this isn't anywhere near the quality I'm used to. Oh, wait. No, I went and looked back at the reveal trailers for Borderlands and mm-hmm. Borderlands 2. 20% and like, more. Wub. Wub. And the, okay, so like I went back and looked at the reveal trailer for Borderlands 1. It doesn't even seem like the same game that we ended up getting. Like, it was a vastly different feeling game that they were advertising in the reveal trailer for the original Borderlands. So maybe they're not good at reveal trailers. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, was, like it. it wasn't bad. Um, I think the classes look interesting. I, I mean, we have a lady who turns into Shiva, um, another lady that pilots a mech, and then two gun dudes that I'm not really sure what distinguishes them from each other well i thought the gun dude i thought the one gun dude had a mac maybe i was miss i misidentified that what one of the one of the scenes it looked like the 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 shorter of the the ladies was driving the mac huh so i i just assumed like she got a mac and that's cool i'm curious what kind of game this is going to be i'm also curious about that Mm -hmm. i i have a feeling that it will probably be some sort of a live services game. Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, nobody wants to hear that, but like, I have a feeling that that's what's going to happen. This is I. I also have that 3, feeling. Borderlands the MMO. Yeah, I mean, it was it's Borderlands three. Like, hey, we we started this formula that everyone has turned into this, so let's do that again. We want we'll, our we'll, monies. We'll, we want our monies. We want our cut. Yeah, that's honestly my fear is that like it won't be a direct sequel to the the first two games, and instead it will be a genre branch out. Also, like I was my really wanting my primary st- concern about this game is that the writers of Borderlands Two are no longer at Gearbox. Yeah, pretty big concern. Yeah, because because that was kind of the thing. Borderlands One's story was thin but compelling. And it had really interesting characters. Like, that was... Borderlands 1 existed on the character that you were introduced to. Like, they were interesting. Like, I wanted to know more about them. And to some extent, like, Borderlands 2 had a better story. But it was, again, very character-driven. But it also turned all of the Borderlands 1 characters into NPCs with full stories and writing and things like that. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, it seems like that's happening again. Because, like, I saw lots of familiar faces. Sure. Also, I saw a lot of characters that I only recognize from Tales from the Borderlands, but I don't know anything about Tales from the Borderlands because I never played it. Yeah, I heard a lot of people mention that. Maybe they were able to steal those riders away from uh, Telltale? Telltale when Telltale died. I was going to say, Telltale's not using them anymore. But notably, the writer for Borderlands 2 was not on the project for Borderlands the pre-sequel, and you could tell. It showed. <laughs> So uh, I I have concerns. Like I I have to say, like the uh, the the D and D campaign was some of the most interesting, like an interesting rum- rumination on like how children process loss, and like it felt very good and genuine, and I love that DLC so much. And like that's a high bar, and I worry that. I worry that you're not going to make it. And then if you make a live service, I have yet to be really impressed with live services ability to tell stories, which is, which is kind of why I'm a little twitchy because while yes, Borderlands does have billions of billions of guns. That's not actually why I enjoy playing it. I've played lots of games with billions and billions of guns, which to my mind reads like we have some guns and they all feel kind of the same. And like, instead what you're doing is, spreadsheeting them against each other to figure out which one is best yeah that was the thing with borderlands is like i felt like there was no reason to ever branch out of whatever my favorite foundry was 
because it had an answer to whatever I wanted to do. Which that's fine, but like you, even if you get a new item in that foundry, now you have to figure out if it is better or not. At this point, I feel like we were probably like two years out from the launch of this game, so lots of things can change in two years. Being generous. Yeah. I mean, I realize they've been working on it a while, but I i mean, they didn't show any gameplay, so they're not that far along yet. Any other uh, trailers this week that uh, anyone now remembers? I mean, I, mean it did, I think it came out last week, but we did get a teaser for System Shock 3, which doesn't tell us a whole lot, but it does tell us that Shodan is back, and they got the voice actress back for her. So yeah, that got was a- chilling as hell. Yeah, so we've got we've got at least one friend of ours who's going to be really excited about that. I'm guessing. I boy, I hope I don't need to know anything about System Shock One or Two. <laughs> I mean, whatever you need to know will probably get explained to you within the opening. It's you know, the important stuff is pretty straightforward. Uh, insane AI thinks she's a god. Okay, so that's that's so. I was gonna say like. I feel like those types of games have, at least in the since that game, sort of hinged on a, like, Act 3 twist. I'm looking at you, Bioshock. So I wasn't so, sure if there's an Act 3 twist of System Shock 2 that I should finally get myself spoiled on. I mean, System Shock 2 did have a twist. It was the same twist as Bioshock, basically. Oh, okay. Like, System Shock 2 did that twist first. I heard a lot of people say that Bioshock was just System Shock 2 again, but I didn't think that was literal. I mean, I would... I mean, it was certainly, like... It was a spiritual successor to System Shock 2, obviously. We already knew that. Um, Like, the stuff around the twist is different. It's... I mean, okay, look. the I think the... um, I think the time is up on on the spoilers for System Shock Two it's and Bioshock. Years. But the the twist that the person who has been helping you out that you've been working for is actually the villain is that that's the twist in both of them. Yeah. Uh, so is Shodan helping you out? So when you wake up in System Shock Two, you wake up in having been uh bo- having been cyborged in the med lab of this ship and a woman has basically has contacted you via the radio to woken you up apprises you to what's going on and guides you out of the med lab and then is basically having you help them try and figure out the larger problem and deal with the ship's ai that has apparently like shut down half the ship and you need to deactivate it to have any hope of getting out of there you ultimately have to find out when you finally reach the office of the woman that she's been dead this whole time. It's actually been Shodan guiding you around. And she does want you to help shut down the ship's AI because the ship's AI is holding her here. Problem is, it's also the only hope you have of getting out of there, of you know, doing anything about the horrible, weird biological infestation that's already also taken over the ship. So you have to continue working with her after that until finally at the very end, you know. But yeah, so the 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 core of the core premise of the person you've been working for is actually the villain is the same. The everything around it and in particular what happens after you learn that is pretty different. Yeah, but I feel like Bioshock would have been better if it ended soon after you learned that rather than continued. It probably would have been better if it had ended sooner after, yeah. Like there's there there's there's a lot of stuff after you figure out what's you know, after you bludgeon Andrew Ryan to death with a golf club. Yeah, and I think System Shock 2 doesn't really have that problem because like the reveal is pretty shocking, but it's also basically at that point it doesn't really matter now. Like you're kind of on the same side for now and you just have to you know be aware that this is a an ai with delusions of grandeur that you know wants to basically rule all of humanity and the game ends with like both shodan and the weird biological investigation that turns people into zombies being ejected and into space and so presumably the third game is going to take place on whatever planet they landed on so 
So this is where the concept of GLaDOS came from, huh? GLaDOS was a lot to Shodan. I mean, Shodan is more just pure in-your-face evil. <laughs> she's not as passive-aggressive as GLaDOS. She's just aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, she she does spend a lot of time insulting you, but they're, they're more direct insults. Oh, pitiful meat running through her corridors. But yeah, I mean, System Shock 2 is on the short list of of FPS that I have played through from start to finish multiple times. So I'm definitely looking forward to System Shock 3, and I, I hope it like lives up to what it could be. This is another one where I wonder, who are the writers? Yeah. Yeah, who's making this? And also, who's making... Is the same company also making that System Shock 2 remake we saw? Or is that a different company? I'm not sure... Like, for the longest time, the System Shock 2, like, reskin and everything was a fan thing. And I don't know if the remake that's happening now is a separate thing, or if they got a hold of the fan stuff. Or um, I mean, Warren Spector is running the company, making System Shock 3. Okay. Um, and there's a bunch... It's, it's... Okay, the studio doing System Shock 3 is a bunch of former Looking Glass and Irrational developers. So it's all people that worked on either that on one and or two. And or Bioshock. Possibly. <laughs> Presumably. So yeah, I mean, the people involved should know what they're doing. Other side entertainment versus Night Dive Entertainment Studios, who is making the System Shock 2 remake. Oh, okay. And apparently Warren Spector has has said that like the protagonists of the previous two games are both going to show up in this one. Oh. That's interesting. Okay, he he wants to he wants the third game to explore why Shodan wants to destroy humanity. Like what what exactly really is motivating her? Because he's right, we really haven't seen much of exactly what the motivation is there. Just you know, this AI was running a satellite, and then it tricked someone into tricked the protagonist of the first game into removing her ethical constraints, and <clears throat> then things went bad because. You That's know. the kind of the unit. It makes shoes for orphans. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so ba- based on who is involved, like my, my hopes might are actually high be okay. Is, yeah, my, my hopes are actually pretty high. We'll know more in a year or two when we get another trailer. <laughs> Y'all, I think the only other significant thing that I've been doing this week is I have been messing around with Simu. So I saw the start of this. <laughs> Bell. I feel like you could do something that's less brutally punishing to yourself. Like, I don't know, get into the Souls games? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the shocking thing is, is like, in the grand scheme of things, it's gone pretty smoothly. I mean, getting a um, emulator running on the PC is way less stuff than, like, getting Monster Hunter Online set up. Yeah, like, like I've done crazier things before. Getting a Fantasy Star Online account set up that was one of them getting a chinese mmo monster hunter online was another one of them um this really wasn't too bad um and now i'm running breath of the wild in 4k (laughs) and it it plays remarkably well like far better than i expected it to i mean it, it still only runs at 30 frames per second which is kind of what it runs on the console anyway but um so the the long and short here is simu is a wii u emulator and that really means that because the most popular wii u game that's available is breath of the wild it's breath of the wild emulator and it just it it runs phenomenally well um i've tried several other wii u games and um they've all worked well too so it kind of floors me that we've reached a point where like modern games are running on these things or somewhat modern games are running on these things. No, the Wii emulator got a giant leg up from the fact that Wii's architecture and the GameCube's architecture were basically not different. Right. Right. And I don't know if any of that work also carried through to the Wii U. It might have. And also like to some extent, Nintendo has put themselves in this position where they're, consoles are not exactly grasping at brand new cutting edge stuff they (laughs) traditionally run lower resolution than whatever the modern consoles are are running which is full Um, of cutting edge technology that's just because it was required to make it that tiny 
And I think the other side effect of this is like Nintendo games are not available on any other platforms ever. So <laughs> they become the number one target for getting working emulators. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, like I, so when Breath of the Wild originally came out, I bought it on the Wii U because it didn't have a Switch. And then when the Switch came out, I decided, oh, I'll restart it. And as a result, I never made it terribly far into the game because, you know, restarting it like immediately after it originally uh, it originally started playing on the Wii U um, had a very been there, done that feel. But like now, as of today, it's been a while. Like, yeah, it's been a while. So like I'm experiencing Breath of the Wild kind of again with fresh eyes and it looks gorgeous because it's being rendered in 4K. <laughs> Um, which just, I mean, it's, it's hard to, to explain how cool that ends up looking like Breath of the Wild was kind of a pretty game anyway, because of what it did from a stylistic standpoint. But when you see that, oh, with actual really good resolution too, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, however, as of, as of like right before this show, which is in part what took me a bit to get over here is I have beaten my second, um, divine beast. beast. Yeah, so like I did did the elephant first and did the <laughs> gecko second. I'm not ever gonna remember the name of those beasts. What areas are those? Is that the uh, the I Zora the... and then Goron? I, I was like, I knew that that's Zora how I was the them. elephant. Yeah, yeah, it's the Zora area and the Goron area. And now, well, they also were like the closest to where you start. So the Zora seems to be clearly intended to be the first one, as much as that game has anything resembling progression. Yeah. And honestly, you... like the 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 Zora one seemed way harder than the uh, than the Goron area one. So, like, I... it was way harder to get into the Goron area than it was to to beat the the, the Divine Beast. I thought. I remember you did not like the way weapons worked in that game. I still do not like the way weapons work in this game. And I am cheating my ass off in Simu. Oh, <laughs> there, there is a there is a community supported patch that makes weapons not break, uh, and that instantly makes this game way more enjoyable for me. That's the other side benefit of of emulators, because like that is the core problem I have with Breath of the Wild. It's like I hate the fact that it's it's the whole Halo problem. This is why I haven't traditionally gotten into Halo games. Is like I feel like I'm constantly picking up random trash off the ground just so i can keep moving forward um and that's what happens in breath of the wild is like your weapons break constantly so you're you're in a constant mode of trying to find the next workable thing um whereas like now i'm utilizing my inventory to keep useful things in my inventory like there are certain types of things that are useful in certain situations and i'm holding on to them for that purpose so like i still have one of the the giant lead hammers or steel hammers or whatever they were um uh, because like they're really good for fighting the little rock monsters that pop up out of the ground but yeah i mean like that that's another side effect of, of playing <laughs> in an unofficial statue is I, like i can i can play these things and it's, it's fine but yeah i mean i i'm just impressed at the state of this and like it works way better than the 3ds emulators have ever worked <laughs> i do wonder about like so what does that exactly say about breath of the wild if you like can take this core feature that they obviously designed for get rid of it and be like this game is now much better. like you didn't see there there wasn't any underlying value to having that mechanic nope. in the game there was no value at all that's like a the, contentious point, but I kind of agree with you. I mean, but like... Some people do, like, a uh, whole scavenging thing. I just kind of don't. Like, it involves me leaving a lot of stuff on the ground, and that's fine. I leave a lot of weapons on the ground in Skyrim. But, like, that... It, like, again, that is a core mechanic of the game, and I just feel like the game is better without it. Well, like, one of the things that this does do is, like, I guess it always lets you play with the weapons you want to play with. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's like the difference between Halo and Destiny, for example, is like I get to use the weapons that I want to use. Um, whereas like in Halo, I feel like I'm constantly having to use weapons I don't really like using. But anyway, it's gorgeous. I'm enjoying myself. 
I'm kind of at this point obsessed with Breath of the Wild again. <laughs> Only, That's you good. know, like a year late. Whatever. But other than that, I don't know if there was anything major that happened this week. Um, anything else we want to discuss before we close it out? Nope. Well, hopefully you enjoy the show, and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. See you. Good night.